Hello, everybody, and greetings from the Delta College Planetarium. My name is Brian, and I'm here to bring you another episode in our continuing series about the constellations. We're nearing the end of summer now, and there's a large summer constellation we've still not discussed. Previously in this series, we've examined Hercules, the Strongman, Scorpius, the Scorpion, Sagittarius, the Archer, Libra, the Scales, and Aquila, the Eagle. But there's this big gap here in the middle of this ring of constellations. This hole is plugged by two, or maybe three, depending on how you count, figures. If you look at this area long enough and under dark enough skies, you may start to see a sort of large circle of stars. They aren't particularly bright, and this circle isn't particularly round. I've seen it described as a broken circle. This shape forms the body of a person in the constellation Ophiuchus. It's a bit difficult to see, but if you imagine drawing the right lines between the stars, you can start to see the body of a man standing face on, his legs dipping below the circle into the region that contains Scorpius. Ophiuchus means the serpent bearer, so it's no surprise that the next constellation is a snake. Serpens is unique among the constellations because it's the only one that's divided into two non-contiguous parts. To the west of Ophiuchus is the head of the snake, Serpens Caput. The head starts in a triangle of faint stars, and then the body extends down to the bottom of the circle portion of Ophiuchus. We pick Serpens up again on the other side of Ophiuchus. Serpens Cauda extends out to the east and curves upwards the tail ending just below the wing of Aquila. Even though Serpens is divided into two parts, the head and the tail, Caput and Cauda, it is considered one constellation. But honestly, I usually think of Ophiuchus and Serpens as one unified figure in the night sky. Ophiuchus and Serpens sit just above the plane of the Milky Way and in the direction of the core of the galaxy. This is a very rich area of the night sky, packed with interesting objects. Numerous globular clusters dot the sky through the circle of Ophiuchus. Serpens is home to Messier 16, the Eagle Nebula. The Eagle Nebula is itself home to the Pillars of Creation, a set of pillars of dark dust made famous when they were photographed by the Hubble Space Telescope. The pillars are being eroded by the radiation of a nearby star out of frame. But in the meantime, the gas of those pillars is being compressed and undergoing the process of star formation. Those new stars are revealed when we examine the pillars in infrared light. But Ophiuchus and Serpens also serve as a reminder of the changing nature of the night sky. Over the course of a human lifetime, the night sky doesn't change very much. This can lead to the false impression that the stars are permanent and unchanging. The universe does change, but on a timescale that dwarfs our regular measures of time. It's only through passing down our astronomical observations over the generations that we can recognize their patterns. This region displays the changing nature of the night sky in an even more dramatic way. In October of 1604, the world was greeted suddenly by a bright new star in the Serpent Bearer. This star outshone all other stars in the night sky and even the planet Jupiter. Johannes Kepler spent two years studying the sudden phenomenon, culminating in his work, De Stella Nova, on the new star. In his time, Kepler was able to establish that the bright phenomenon took place beyond the solar system and among the stars. This spelled doom for the classical belief that the stars remained fixed and unchanging in the firmament. Today we understand that Kepler was seeing a Type 1a supernova. Type 1a supernovae are a particular kind of stellar explosion caused when a white dwarf star reaches a critical mass. The white dwarf can only reach this mass if it's pulling material down to its surface, so we believe these supernovae occur primarily in binary star systems. The white dwarf may be stealing material from a nearby giant star companion. Remember that a white dwarf star is a dead star, mostly made of carbon and oxygen. There is no nuclear fusion occurring on a white dwarf. As the mass of the white dwarf increases, the temperature and pressure at the core of the white dwarf also increase. When the white dwarf reaches a critical temperature and pressure, carbon and then oxygen fusion can spontaneously occur. 
In a matter of seconds, a significant portion of the White Dwarf undergoes nuclear fusion, releasing so much energy so quickly that the White Dwarf is torn apart. In 1941, astronomers at the Mount Wilson Observatory located the remnant of Kepler's supernova. More recently, space-based telescopes like the Chandra X-ray Observatory have shown us images of the shell of material ejected by the supernova. Years of observations reveal the dynamic and evolving nature of the explosion, as we can see clouds of material deform and move as the shockwave from the supernova continues to expand some 400 years later. So if it's clear where you are tonight, go out and search for Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer, and Serpens, the serpent, among the summer stars. And try to imagine what it must have been like on that October evening in 1604 when a star suddenly appeared. That's it for today. Next time, we'll take a closer look at another constellation. This is Brian from the Delta College Planetarium, wishing you clear skies. <laughs>